So I think we can get started. So I'm going to share my screen. Host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay. So Jacob, can you uh, allow me to share my screen? Uh, yeah, let me see. <laughs> I don't know that I have post permissions, but I just asked Allie to give you permission to do. Okay, awesome. Well, we wait for that. I'd just like to welcome you all here. And I'd like to kind of get a sense of who's in the room. So you should have like a reactions button on the lower part of your screen. Uh, and you can like you know, clap or that type of stuff. So just out of curiosity, how many uh, veterans do we have in this group? If, you, if, you, if you're a veteran, why don't you, uh, Give me a uh, check yes uh, emoji. Okay, so we got uh, Chaplain Brennan. Anybody else? All right, so how about uh, anybody here, a uh, family member of a veteran? So it might be a spouse, daughter, son. Okay, got a couple more. Got Carrie. Thank you, Carrie. Okay, anybody uh, extended family? So cousins, aunts, yes, uncle, uncle, grandparents. All right. So William, all right. See you. Thank you. Yeah. So the point of this this question is to really help us understand that uh, military service affects more than just the service member. It affects everybody that, that a service member interacts with. So my family, for example, when I go away to work on a daily basis or when I go away for annual training, uh, it affects them as well. And so military service affects more than just the service member. So let's see if I can share my screen now so I can share my slides. There we go. Um, are you still? Okay, awesome. All right, can everybody see the slides all right? So for those of you who don't know me, I like to um, interact with the audience and that's kind of weird in this digital format. But uh, when I ask a question, that's an actual question. So please feel free to chime in um, and we'll hopefully help this be a lot more easy, a lot more of an enjoyable uh, presentation for you all. So a little bit about who I am. Uh, I'm Chaplain Paul Epley with the Michigan Army National Guard. I'm in civvies because I'm we're still working from home. Uh, typically I wear a uniform to work and it's really cold in my bedroom so I have my turtleneck on. So <laughs> please forgive me for my turtleneck. But it's the only way I can stay warm. I am completing my doctorate at Michigan State University where I study military families primarily. So when you heard like the socio-ecological theories or the um, social constructionist theory, that really helps to frame how I view uh, the military culture and families. And so hopefully that's a good heuristic for you to use as well. I'm currently in the final stages of my doctorate. All the classes are done. So thank goodness I didn't have to do any classes with the COVID stuff happening. Uh, and I'm actually in my dissertation phase where I'm actually studying military relationship education programs. Uh, in a COVID environment, go figure that out. So <clears throat> the presentation for today, I have a screen over here. So when you see me looking over here, it's me looking at the slides. We're going to cover military culture, families and relationships. Uh, my contact information is at the bottom of the slide in case you would like to reach out to me uh, after the presentation. Uh, if you text me during the presentation, I probably won't get it. Um, so Chaplain Brennan, I did see your text come through. I'm not ignoring you, but I am ignoring you for the time being. Um, what else? Yeah, I think that's it. Let's uh, hop in. So disclaimer on the slideshow. So I've worked closely with the Center for Deployment Psychology out of Bethesda, Maryland to create a specific military culture slides and content for uh, the general community. Uh, these slides are used with an agreement with the CDP and the Michigan National Guard. However, because I had to condense a day long presentation down into an hour and a half, I had to condense a lot of, a lot of the slides. So when you see a slide that looks like a CDP slide, it's a, got a blue banner across the top, it says CDP, 
that is their content that I help them create. So just be aware that there will be some formatting differences uh, on a few slides through the presentation. Uh, another disclaimer is <clears throat> I speak Army because I'm an Army chaplain. And so when I say soldier, I mean no disrespect to the Air Force or to the Marines or the Navy or the Coast Guard or the Space Force for that matter um, when I default to the, the language in which I speak. Also, if I say Army, again, no disrespect to those other branches. So um, if you have more questions about the Center for Deployment Psychology, uh, what curriculums they have and trainings they have, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm more than happy to connect you with them. Uh, they have the Star Behavior Health Programs, which we have in Michigan. Awesome program. Um, actually, much of this content comes from a tier one of that. Uh, they also have training specifically for uh, mental health providers. So if you happen to be a mental health provider, they have uh, two-day trainings uh, that focus on uh, psychological health rates and evidence-based practices to treat them and how to assess them. And then uh, really intensive two-day sessions as well uh, on specific treatment modalities for therapists. So are there any questions before I get too far down the road? Here, I see your hand up. So I'm going to assume that's a, uh, I don't know, I, I got stuck up type thing. So we're gonna keep on moving forward. Harry, if you do have something, uh, feel free to just chime in, okay? So a brief overview of the agenda, just like the title slide. Uh, if you missed it on the title slide, we're going to talk about military culture. We're going to talk about ethos, what ethos is, how that affects pe the way people view reality. We're going to talk about military families and by extension, uh, also understand how interpersonal relationships uh, play out when a service member has those relationships. So here's the discussion slide. Military culture. Now this picture is from a, a sequel to the Band of Brothers uh, miniseries. And in this picture, I'm curious, what things do you notice about, or that might chime um, or make you think about military culture? Any takers? Yeah, I'll jump in. Uh, this is Drew Brennan. Um, you know, things that jump out to me that suggest military culture or military. Um, one is the uniforms, obvious uh, telltale sign of their uh, vocation. Um, uh, second is the sense of, of bond or care, um, parent support, you know, we're taught all the time not to leave a fallen comrade. And it seems like, um, that that's probably the context that's, that's in this photo and, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll shut up now. <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Drew. So yes, we have the bond, kind of like the band of brothers. We have the connection that they have, we have the uniforms, um, some other things that might stick out to people is, does it look like they're having a good time in this picture? Probably not. It looks like they are really working together to help this person out, but there's a, there's a hardship there. And part of military ethos and military culture is that it trains service members to be able to endure hardships. Later on in the presentation, when we talk about families and relationships, uh, the military doesn't necess necessarily train the spouse to be able to endure hardships, such as a deployment and, and how that can affect them. So we'll get a little bit more into that uh, at the latter end of this presentation. Are there any other uh, observations before we move on to the next slide? I have a couple. This is Janice from Grand Rapids Community College. Yeah, Janice. One is the no man left behind um, that they have. And the other, and I could be totally wrong, totally off base, but the one in the middle looks small smaller frame, which kind of tells me could possibly be female. So that joint male, female unity that the uh, military is trying to create makes me think of this. This makes me think of that. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Janice. I really like the fact that you touched upon uh, never leave a fallen uh, comrade, which is part of the warrior ethos. Now, in the context of moral injury, could that be a moral injurious event? If you're 
in a in a fight and you have to withdraw and in the process of withdrawing you realize your battle buddy was left behind i'm going to answer for you i think that could very possibly be a moral injurious event especially when you're trained not to leave a fallen comrade um, and today we're still exhuming graves overseas to find people that we had to leave behind. Uh, they, I, I hear that the VA and uh, the Department of Defense will actually send Vietnam veterans over to Vietnam to help them uh, find their friends that were lost in the jungle. So this is still going on today. So <clears throat> we're going to divert here and to talk about theory. Um, so when you hear theory, what types of things come to mind? Or is that just like some word that PhDs use to, I don't know, control the world? This is, this is Bill Weitzel. I would say maybe academic uh, uh, perspective, uh, some research that's based, uh, that has provided a base of uh, information. Yeah, it's like you said, Bill, it helps us to understand what we're actually looking at, right? It's an explanation of the observed. It also tries to explain um, what we see as well. So absolutely, anybody else? So why is it important to actually be able to explain what we observe? What do you think about that question? Sorry, you might come off. Do you have something? Uh, yeah, Drew Brennan again. So I think we, we just encounter so so much information in the world um, and and certainly can't even absorb it all, but we need some sort of framework to under, to better understand it, or I guess it's just uh, utter chaos. And so having a theory that we operate in helps us to provide um, some boundaries on, on our thinking and, and, and a framework to an analyze things a little bit better. Yeah, absolutely. So within research, we have theories. So that way we actually know how to measure the things that we observe. So when we talk about culture, it can be kind of hard to measure culture, um, but theory allows us to be able to do that. So I'm going to go to a quick video here about social constructionism. Social constructionism is a theory um, that's uh, not so well held today. I was had its uh, upbringing, I believe, in the 1970s. And it really helps to describe how different cultures view real reality differently. So when you talk about service members, when they look at the world, they see the world through the context of their experiences and serving in the military and to a lesser extent, their families as well. So this uh, video is from uh, the Khan Academy and it can be found on YouTube. Let's see what we got here. If it wants to play. All right, so apparently that video does not want to play, although it's embedded. So we will move beyond that. Uh, social constructionism theory really talks about how there are social agreements amongst people groups. Um, when I first learned about this theory, I thought it was just total hogwash because I have a tendency to be more concrete in my thinking. But as I started to see uh, things with uh, the civil unrest unraveling over the last few years and different cultures, I started to really appreciate this, this theory because it helped me to understand that the way I view the world and how people act and behave can be different than how other people uh, interact in the world. Um, we can see this, for example, in regards to um, our Asian, um, let's see, I think it's in Japan, right, where it's honorable for a person of a certain age to suicide, whereas our culture would view that act as, why would you ever do that? Because that preservation of life. So there's that different understanding of the world and how we interact with it and view it. So to help put this in context, I'm curious, do we have any service providers, any mental health providers or doctors um, in this group by chance? Yes, I, I'm a retired doctor. Uh, actually, I served with the Marines in Vietnam for a year as a surgeon and uh, uh, retired as a vascular transplant surgeon, but uh, yes. Awesome. Thank you, Larry. 
So I'm curious, Larry, did some of your patients- yeah, I'm a clinical care physician. Was it you, Bert? There's another one of us here. Okay. I'm a critical care doctor, retired Grand Rapids, <laughs> but I was uh, in the same area as uh, Dr. Robson all day. I was in uh, Fitzsimmons Hospital in, in Denver, uh, training and then taking care of Vietnam returnees. Okay. So I'm curious, did all of your patients, did some of them come with, to you with more advanced stages of the illness? Are they who, all who, are you, who are you talking to? I, either you or Bert. Well, obviously in, in a military setting, yes. Uh, somebody needs to mute. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, we had a large triage area where I was. Uh, we were located in Quang Tree in very northern and south Vietnam. And we would uh, have all many different levels of injuries, of course. And uh, the Marines, I believe, were the only service that took care of the enemy. So we did take care of the NVA as well. But the corpsmen and so forth would triage people out and, and who had to go to surgery right away and who could wait a little bit and so forth. So yes, there was a great variety of injuries. Yeah, and with working with uh, service members, even in today's context, a lot of times what you'll see is that a service member will put off receiving treatment until, until that uh, injury is exasperated enough to it where they really don't have a choice. Then so doing so, they actually have to violate their ethical codes uh, by putting the mission first, they actually have to put themselves first to actually receive treatment. And that can be very difficult for them. And so I have this quote here, which really tries to sum up a lot of my experiences working with uh, service members, primarily 2010 to 2013 timeframe these were calf scouts, you know, they were hardcore, hard charging individuals. And as a chaplain, a lot of times what I'd have is about maybe an hour ish to triage the individual, like you said, Larry, and to come to a decision of yes, I can provide the support this service member needs or their unit can, or no, this service member actually needs to receive support in their larger community. And at the end of that hour, I'd say, you know, it really seems like you should probably talk to a counselor or you should probably see a doctor about that. And nine out of 10 times, the soldier, their, their whole affect would change, their head would drop, their shoulders would sag, and they'd say, sir, they just don't get it. And they'd probably use a four letter word in there too. <clears throat> and that helped, uh, helped me to understand that there's this big cultural divide that when we look at social constructionism, that the soldier really has this idea and this, uh, this concept of what it means to serve and that might be a barrier to care. That might, might be the same with uh, moral injury as well, that they might not actually wanna receive help to get through the injury that they sustained because they just don't feel like anybody else gets it. And so when we think about culture, we oftentimes think about things that we see, how people act, um, and also belief systems. And so here's a slide that's taken from the Center for Deployment Psychology that tries to describe culture using an iceberg. And when we think culture, a lot of times we'll see things uh, such as the salute, the rank, you know, how they, how they sit up straight or how they walk or how they carry their hands, how they cut their hair. And that's, that's like, a, uh, tells you right away if somebody's service member a lot of times is how their haircut looks. But there's a lot of culture that's really underneath the surface. And that's what they believe. That's, uh, you know, that discipline, that teamwork, their expectations uh, about their society and how people interact, the selfless, selflessness, the stoicism. And military culture, to a large degree, mirrors that of the American culture, the American values and beliefs. But I would argue that it really ups the ante a little bit more um, because of the ingrained nature, the acculturation that the service member actually goes through. So to describe culture, we talk, oftentimes talk about this thing called ethos. Now ethos is, has its root in Greek, which is really a, dist a distinguishing character or sentiment of a group or institution. And according to the Center for Deployment Psychology in 2021, they would say that warrior ethos are ancient and largely unchanged through the millennia. There's a world and self and other view that imbues and colors everything the professional service member is and does. Now, I would kick back a little bit on this definition by the CDP. 
by changing the two words that are highlighted there. I'd say the warrior ethos is based in history, but yet it's ever changing. That the military is not a stagnant organization. If it were a stagnant organization, it would lose its, its rev, uh, how important it is really quickly. So it's ever changing. We can see this uh, within the past 10 years, for example, with how they accept or not accept LGBTQ individuals. Uh, it was before that uh, don't ask, don't tell policy was in place, changing you know, back to zero tolerance. And now the new president, we'll see how that changes again. So the military culture has to adapt over time to keep a pace with the US culture. So if you had, back when we had hunter gatherer societies and people walking around with sticks and spears and uh, really small tribal units, the warrior class, our teamers, those were the hunters. They would take and they would protect the rest of the tribe from animal threat. But as time would go, the need to protect against animals started to subside and the need to defend a nation's sovereignty and their rights started to grow. And so we see this emergence of the warrior class. I have, for example, here, uh, the picture here is of the Chin, uh, his grave. The Chin is the individual tribal citizen to one unified country. And when the Chin died, he wanted to be buried with these Terrancada warriors to help him in the afterlife. And he's also so paranoid about his, his death and his, uh, how he's, I knew, uh, they, they still had not exhumed his grave, although we know where it's at, because the, th the fear of these booby traps actually being real. They've actually found uh, elements of these booby traps in the groundwater, such as um, lead and mercury, which the booby traps were said to have had. So as people groups grow, so does the need to have a professional military. However, it's not stagnant. As, as things get more complex, as technology advances, we see that our military really needs to adapt. I have a picture here of a German soldier using virtual reality. Now, 10 years ago, this would probably be just a laughing stock for a lot of people, and even drones or UAVs were not really used until OIF, OEF, I think it was around 2008, uh, don't quote me on that, that they actually started to gain proper use. And when a service member within the Army goes through what's called their intermediate leadership course, which I'm currently in, they teach us that the future engagements will encompass things such as information, technology, uh, infrastructure and more in what's referred to as multi-domain warfare. And so as we think of warfare moving forward, it'll be much more cyber type, um, not necessarily just this force on force, Rommel and Patton's tanks going head to head, but it'll be much more uh, uh, under the radar and what would be referred to as a small war. Uh, Chaplain Byrne, do you have anything you want to add to that? I know you're much more advanced your military career at War College than I am. Um, I don't have a lot to add to that. I think it's just, uh, you know, the ever evolving warfare that, um, you know, it's, it's the combination of the increased emphasis on technology, but that has to be balanced by the, the power of technology to destroy other technologies. And so while simultaneously um, developing, relying on technology, we almost have to go back to the bare basics of, of soldiering, if you will, as well. Um, because we recognize that these things can be wiped out if, if the uh, opposing force has a technology that can um, break up the electronic signals and that sort of thing. So it's, so it's interesting how technology kind of pulls us in both directions uh, simultaneously. Thank you very much. We're like Taffy, right? I once heard it said that you can never take a city unless you send in the infantry. You can bomb it as much as you want. You can do anything else you do as much as you want, but eventually you got to send in the foot soldier to secure it. So uh, moving forward, you know, start to think about why we have to have this ethos and what does the military ethos do? Now this is a CDP slide. And within this slide, they talk about how ethos really protects the warrior from serious moral and psychological damage. It gives them a construct in their brain to be able to process what they're actually going through and give meaning to it. When we talk about moral injury, sometimes that meaning, it doesn't fit. A lot of people will come from, a lot of Americans will come from what's called a just world theory, which suggests that good things happen to good people. And when you're in the service and say your buddy gets shot or killed, that can be really difficult to make sense of, sense of when you think, oh, good things happen to good people. How could this bad thing happen to me or them? Uh, it also helps to preserve the service member through extreme hardship. Going back to the question I asked earlier about uh, that Larry talked about the, the different stages in which people came to him. Uh, service members will have a tendency to push and push and push and push uh, until they're broken to a pretty bad extent because the ethos that's embedded within them 
helps to propel them to endure through that hardship and that pain. It also helps the service member to have a moral focus in morally ambiguous situations. Uh, looking back at some of the situations that were service members find themselves or where they, they don't have quite good guidance on what to do. The, the rules of engagement perhaps uh, don't give them guidance on how to be able to respond to the threat that they face. And so with a good ethos established in them, they'll, have, they'll be able to make those decisions and those decisions will be able to be ethically based, hopefully. How is it that the military establishes this ethos? Well, our TDP slide here talks about how a service member will start to be ingrained with this ethos and this culture, acculturation from day one of boot camp. In some cases, even before day one of boot camp, if they be, belong to a military family or a family that really supports the military. Once they become it, once they get into the institution, they now are subject to rules, taboos, uh, certain ceremonies, oaths of commissioning. Uh, we have things such as uh, written creeds, the soldier's creed, for example, uh, values such as the army values. Uh, so it's out, uh, leadership, loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, and integrity, and personal courage. Those values help to shape the service member, and more importantly, how that service member, again, views reality. So, for example, when a service member just gets home, from a deployment and they're sitting in Starbucks and somebody's complaining about their coffee being cold, that service member may think, why are you complaining? Nobody's dead. Because they view things through that lens of, you know, cold coffee is nothing to, to worry about. I had that every single day last year and it was awful. You know, it was, it was might as well just been, I don't know, turpentine. I and mean, looks like muddy water and tastes like turpentine is how the, the, the cadence goes. Because service members are again, trained to be able to deal with extreme hardship they are trained to be able to suck it up and soldier on or carry on, uh, even at their own detriment in some cases. Now I will say, and uh, Kevin Brim might be able to back me up on this one, is that as our culture continues to evolve within the military, we are seeing some soldiers who are actually starting to realize that seeking help earlier is the right thing to do. And we actually have executive leadership backing that up. And if a soldier needs to take a knee, they got the leaderships back, uh, backing them as well. So, question for you, how have you witnessed military culture play out in your life, home, town, or elsewhere? So when you walk down the road on a yearly basis, what things do you see that describe military culture within your current communities? Well, this is Bill Weitzel, and uh, I'll tell you a situation with our granddaughter. Um, I'm trying to think of the the, the um, Navy. I think it was an admiral. He was in um, kind of special ops that wrote the book about uh, it was at making your bed. Um, and uh, one of the things I we bought the book for our granddaughter because uh, she was maybe. 12 or 13 years old, but I noticed her brothers never made their bet. And uh, we and she was pretty uh, conscientious. And so uh, I, we bought the book on Amazon and sent it to her. Uh, I'm trying to think, uh, Admiral, uh, uh, some folks remember, he was UT Austin uh, Chancellor after, uh, does anybody remember the name of the author? that uh, he's written and he came up with a new book called Heroes, H-E-R-O-E-S, and uh, McRaven, Admiral McRaven. But how the military, he, his ex explanation of the military culture can be transplanted into the lives of myself, my wife, and our grandchildren, hopefully our children as well. Um, in terms of how the orderliness, responsibility, uh, daily preparation is very important for, for everyone. So I, and I think this has been a fairly, I think he's a popular leader and uh, an author. And I think his book was on the bestseller list on the New York Times list, so. Yeah, awesome, William. You need to talk about the, the tidiness, right? And when you're in basic training, you have to make sure that your, your sheets are so tight and that, your, your covers are so tight on your bed that you actually crawl underneath you. You're underneath the screen or the, the, the springs, you're pulling it tight. 
and the drill sergeant will come up and throw a quarter on it. And if it doesn't bounce, well, you failed. And of course the drill sergeant tells you because your bed's not made, everybody just died because it's, they, they just have to amp it up to that level. For some odd reason, everybody has to die if you, if you don't tie your boot, right? Um, but again, it, it, they try to instill this discipline, not just discipline and, and being able to do your physical fitness, but discipline in all aspects of life. Because through that discipline, you're much less likely to slip up when you are in battle because you know that your rifle probably is clean and won't jam on you. And so, yeah, absolutely. Anybody else want to share how they've seen military culture play out in their life, home, or, or elsewhere? Well, I th <clears throat> Larry, Larry Robson, again, I think for an older person, the way I see it play out is that I don't talk about it hmm. because this me generation, postmodernism, so forth, all that is so contrary to the military ethos and so forth that uh, with young people and people around me, uh, I, I find that they just don't want to hear about it. So I'm probably a coward, but I, I just don't talk about it. Yeah, thanks, Larry. I appreciate that. Yes, yeah, this reluctance to really share. This is, this, this is Bert Dugan. Can you hear me? Yep, me hear you, Bert. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, yeah. The, my experience is that leadership is important, you know, and that's what we see. You know, if you talk to the military guys who are in now, they really pride leadership. They're, if you look up and down the line, everybody, I think, has an idea that they'll be a leader or they could do this well or they can lead people. And, and to go with what Larry's saying, there's kind of an insularity, a solo doing it alone mentality in civilian life that I think is not totally helpful. My wife is, you know, a, a military brat and she was a bowling coach in Grand Rapids and and it was a story of bowling alone structure is important, you know, because she set her own pins when she was growing up in the military to bowl in some little back back base ballet, uh, uh, base somewhere, you know, and, and, and they were very close in that era, you know, so I find to take it where we are now, young people are interested in talking about leadership. They want to know how they can do this. They get some idea that we're not very well led right now. And uh, I don't think it's at the bottom. It is it maybe in the middle range, the millennials or somebody lost the, the path after the greatest generation, maybe after my generation. But I still find people now... Uh, we relate to Alma College up north here, and uh, the students there are very interested. They've done a great job this year of keeping open, following the rules, getting COVID, in, uh, testing, uh, going to a special dorm if they get sick, and they've cooperated. They got kicked out last year when COVID broke out, and they came back in the September of this past year saying, we're not going to screw up again. We're not going to get this school closed. We're going to keep it open. And they did do it. You know, they've now just graduated their class, you know. So I see both sides of it, you know, as Larry's saying, there's a problem, but I still see some of this military principle being carried out in the civilian level, uh, you know, in, in my view, uh, optimistic, I guess. I think that we go through cycles and we have to heal from where we are right now. We've got to have some. So that's my thought. Yeah, so a couple of themes that I'm hearing is back to social constructionism and the get it factor. Sometimes the, the civilian culture doesn't get what the service member actually has been through. And I can only dream that I could imagine what Larry went through in Vietnam. And it sounds like he's been through some, some, some things. And I, I don't know if he'd quite be able to understand what I've been through in Afghanistan. Um, Cause there, there's just the, not the lack of getting it. However, when you look at the, the civilian culture, a lot of times the military will just be I'm like, I don't know if they quite understand. And I have some stats here to back that up in just a little bit. Um, but I also hear this theme of collectivism, right? And that's, you know, what, what fuels a lot of service members to serve. A lot of times it's for patriotism. It's for self, of, or it's for service to country. Um, I, I once heard the quote that the service, the soldier doesn't fight because they hate, hate what's in front of them, but because they love what's behind them, because they love their family and they actually want to serve. Um, and then when you do serve, you, you find yourself in uh, a bond with these other individuals who have the same type of mentality, this, this desire to serve their country um, and even go into harm's way to serve it. So we're going to keep moving forward. So military culture, 
you know, think about elements of military culture. A lot of times people might think of things such as a uniform, right? They might see that uh, camouflage uniform or the dress uniform or the, the Navy's dress whites. They might think of parades and ceremonies. And they might think of medals and decorations. Uh, they may also think of things such as the salute. I, after I think it was this guy who was a member of the Air Force before he landed on the moon. And actually the salute, for example, is something that is earned by being in the military. And it's not expected that, that uh, actually a salute is something that they will actually take away from you if you're dishonorably discharged and end up in the brig. That you cannot salute if you're stuck in Fort Leavenworth prison. They take that right away from you. Um, and the history behind the salute, again, back to the historical roots of the military, is that it was a way to show respect. It was a way to um, different stories. Some will say that during the French aristocracy as a way of showing that you weren't armed, that you weren't going to cloak and dagger somebody. Uh, other people, some stories will say that it goes back to the armor. When we uh, had these, these armor, this armor and we had the, the visor that you'd pick up your visor to show that you were friend and not foe. So regardless of what story you wanna follow is the true history of the salute, the salute still is, viewed today as showing respect. It's always uh, from somebody who's junior to somebody who is senior, uh, enlisted to officer, enlisted never salute each other, but they always salute officers. <clears throat> Some other ways that we might think of culture is how people actually behave. Uh, for example, I like to use the word stoicism. It's another Greek word. Uh, stoicism is this ability to endure extreme hardship and maintain your composure. I remember in basic training, uh, the drill started saying, it's not gonna help you to make that face to do more push-ups. Just do the damn push-ups. And so I learned to really shut down my facial expressions, especially when I'm in pain, because that was ingrained in me. Um, and today within my own life, that really has kind of been counterproductive uh, because my wife wants me to show my expressions, wants me to show how I feel when that's something that is completely against my military culture and bringing, bringing up. Now, stoicism, uh, it comes from the word stoics. It also goes back to the Greek word of stoa or porch, which is where the stoics would stand and share their opinions and be able to endure extreme criticism for what they uh, said and how they viewed reality. We have things also such as respect. So a lot of times a service member, especially if they're very well acculturated, will talk to civilians with ma'am and sir. So if I'm going to Starbucks and I get a coffee, I'll say, thank you, ma'am, or say, thank you, sir. And a lot of times I'll be like, oh, I'm just George, or I'm just Sally, or I'm just Sam. And that's a different culture than what I'm brought up with, and which is in Greg and me and in Greg and a lot of other service members. Another thing that can oftentimes really be irksome to service members is this wonderful word that we talked about before we went into the breakouts, and that is punctuality. Service members are Told that if you are late or if you're on time, you're late. So always be there early, be on time, be ready, be prepared to be able to brief. If you don't know an answer to a question, say, I'll get back to you as a sign of respect. So punctual. They're oftentimes very selfless service members. They are the ones who, again, have volunteered to go to harm's way to protect the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And because they hold that, that can, can sometimes put them in some awkward situations. Uh, we have a brigade here in the Michigan National Guard that after January 6th ended up doing the, the majority of the protection for the U.S. Capitol. And they were actually the higher headquarters for all those operations in the U.S. Capitol. And in that situation, they found themselves potentially not fighting an enemy that looks different and acts different than they do or from a different country. But they found themselves in a situation where they may be called upon to defend the U.S. Capitol against other people who are other Americans who may share some of the same values as they do. And so it can be sometimes difficult uh, when you have these values and you find yourself in these awkward situations. We also see military culture play out in expectations. So I think of what my expectations are. I'm preparing to go on a tour for uh, at least a year, maybe more to Arlington, Virginia to uh, provide oversight of all the program evaluation programs for the Army and the Air Force and the, and, and the National Guard. And as I prepare to make that move here later this uh, year, I think about things such as 
housing. I'm a field grade officer. That means I get a nice house, right? That means I'm going to be more towards the center of a base. Uh, they have a nice house, have a bedroom for each of my kids. I'll probably have three bathrooms. And that's an expectation that I have for my family. Now, in all actuality, what's going to probably happen is I'm going to probably end up in a maybe a thousand foot big uh, apartment because in Virginia, it's very expensive to live. <laughs> And to buy a current a house that's currently what I have, it costs a half a million dollars. And I'm sorry, I just don't have half a million dollars laying around. Um, so housing, that's one expectation that they might have. Promotions. In the military, promotions are expected on a pretty timely basis. If you do your job, you expect to promote at certain time periods. And the military actually has it lined out that you, might, that you have to spend so much time in a certain rank before you can progress to the next rank. And if you spend too much time in that rank, then they're going to boot you out. So it's expected not only that you'll promote within a certain amount of time, but if you don't make that time, then they're going to boot you out. And that can be really hard for people to uh, deal with. How about expectations of others? I usually talk about when I got home from Afghanistan and I, you know, I'm big, lean, mean me. And <clears throat> I was made back for a day. And my wife needed to get something from the store. While being selfless, part of our culture, I said, honey, I'll go to the grocery store. And I knew very well that with what I experienced, that might be a little bit difficult for me to actually go to the store and deal with people. And so I selflessly went to the store a mile down the road here and <clears throat> went to the condiments aisle. And there in the condiments aisle, first thing I noticed was all the variety that, that was there. I how, just all the different condiments that you guys have to choose from on a civilian basis, and that was just overwhelming. But the thing that really struck me the, the most was there was a person standing in the middle of the hallway with their cart totally blocking the aisle. And because I'm a service member and because I can endure hardship, I just, you know, I sat out there and waited nice patiently, do, 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 do. And I waited and this person just stood there blocking the entire aisle. Is this person, continues to stand there and just people start building up on both sides until eventually they move enough out of the way that the people just start blasting through that little gap that this person left, like, like water through the cracks of the dam. And when I, I looked at what she was looking at, she was looking at mayonnaise. And the thing that stuck out to me was how many different types of mayonnaise there are to choose from. I was just overwhelming. And I'm thinking, man, when I was overseas, I had one type of mayonnaise that was in a little squeeze pack and it was oftentimes expired, but I didn't care because it's all we had. Just thinking about how overwhelming this can be and what the expectation I had that, you know, when you're in the military, you're going to stand off the side of the aisle so other people can get, can get by and you're going to get what you get and not throw a fit. So that's what we do. So expectations of others. So how does military culture play out? Again, the words of a soldier, they just don't give it, sir. That when you are fully indoctrinated with the military uh, rights, rituals, rules, taboos, so on and so forth, it really, they, they tear you down to build you up, to build you to be in a certain way so you can go and fight. And that does not always translate well into the civilian community. And so I said I had some stats for you. Hey, I'm, I'm a researcher, this is what we do. I'm sorry if you don't like stats, I love them. By the numbers, less than 20% of community-based therapists have both military cultural competency and evidence-based treatment training to work with the military and their families. And this is a nationwide study done by RAND. So the people who are expected to provide mental health care specifically, oftentimes don't have the skill set to be able to provide that care to service members. Now let's rewind here. This is a Hidden Wounds of War conference, right? Moral injury. Can you think of what it would be like if you have this, this moral, moral injurious event that bothers you on a day, daily basis and you go to seek help, but that provider who you seek help from doesn't get it? A, are you likely to come back? Probably not. B, will the, will the provider be able to give you effective care? Maybe, maybe not. Most of them don't have the training to be able to do that based off of what Tenillion found. 40% of community-based therapists in New York, so this is a more recent study, I think it was uh, 2019, oh, 2018, were familiar with deployment right, related stressors. So that could be things such as um, the environment in which you serve. They understand the difference between active duty and the reserve component, which is good. But again, it's less than 40%. So 
in just a second, I'm going to show you that the vast majority of our military is not active duty. It's the reserve component. And so if, if, if your provider just has all these assumptions that they approach you with, then the chances are they're going to have a lot of missteps and miss the boat and actually providing you or your family members the effective care that you need. 80% were unfamiliar with deployment-related terminology. So deployment-related terminology would be something like an MRAP. What's an MRAP? What's a FOB? What's a COP? Uh, what's an M4? What's an M9? What's a 40 mic mic? Now those types of terminology, which you can Google all these words, they actually have lists that you can get of acronyms um, so you can better understand what the service member is sharing when they talk about, I was in the FOB, we got called up, he's an IDF, um, and then all of a sudden we're rolling out the wire and all of a sudden there's an ID that blew up the MRAP in front of me and it killed my gunner. So you can understand and interpret that effectively. <clears throat> and 34% reported being familiar with military culture and or screened for military affiliation or common conditions among veterans. So even in the way that people, that, that service providers screen their clients is important because if I know that a client has military background, I'll know, I forgot to mention, I'm a therapist uh, by training. I'll know how to better engage with them because I'll know what language to speak, what to expect from that individual. By the Blue Star Families Report, 2019, 47% of military connected families felt that their civilian communities had limited military family lifestyle cultural competency. Lots of words there, basically, um, about half of the families that are linked with the military don't feel like their communities get it. Back to the words of a soldier, it even happens for their families as well. So why is this important? Looking at Fort Michigan specifically and the Michigan National Guard, uh, there was a lot, large study that was conducted between 2008 to 2015, evaluating Michigan National Guard's members, uh, different uh, psychological health rates, um, treatment practices, uh, behavioral stuff, and they also included their spouses or, or significant others. And this study found that 40% of soldiers and 34% of their significant others meant the diagnostic cutoff for one or more mental health conditions. So for the service members, roughly half of them can, can be diagnosed with depression, anxiety, PTSD, substance abuse disorders, or a multitude of those disorders. Of that 40%, only 50% said that they sought help of the service member. 61% of their significant others said that they sought help. Now, this is a unique thing. I, a lot of the reasoning behind this is a thing called stigma, which I'm sure probably most of us are familiar with. And in a study that I completed a few years ago uh, with wounded warriors, we saw that stigma was oftentimes internal or external. Internalized stigma is how I viewed the providers and actually seeking help myself. External stigma would be concerns about military advancement, how my leadership would view me, which was a big barrier to care and led to a lot of people not seeking care in a timely manner, which then caused their condition to advance and pr progress to a point where they had to take, take a knee and get help, which then again went against their cultural values. So kind of a sticky wicket, it's a stick in the mud. Are there any questions about the stats? No, I just endorse. I just want to endorse the the idea that in medicine you never admitted you were having trouble yourself, uh, because that would show your business. If if any colleague knew you were backing off a little bit, and not feeling good, you're dead for referrals and business and trust and. Uh, so you just toughed it out uh, in my experience. And I did finally get to talk to some people who were having trouble because I was chief of medicine for a while at the hospital, but uh, you don't self-disclose it. I'm sure that's true in your area too, Paul. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Bert. I appreciate that. Now you bring up a phenomenon called presenteeism. I'm sure all of us have heard of absenteeism and we probably all see people who are absentees at work growing up, you know, people just don't show up. But presenteeism, according to Harvard Business Review, can actually be worse and more detrimental, to, more detrimental to an organization because it can lead to a third uh, reduction in productivity for the service matter for the individual. And it can also mean, that especially if you're ill and you're not seeking help, that that's again that can 
progress to the point where you actually cannot do anything. And if you're sick, like the flu or something, you can pass it to others. So presenteeism can be a really bad thing. And the service members, you know, a lot of times we'll be at work regardless of what's going on in our lives. And our, our houses could be falling apart and our relationships could be falling apart, but because there's expectation that you show up to work on time, you stay late, then that can cause more issues. Thank you very much, Bert, for sharing that. So the bottom line, <clears throat> communities that lack military cultural competency, which affects the family functioning even after the service. We have a typo in here, apologize for that. When a service member and their family go through military, they're serving in the military, that doesn't just get shut off when they leave the military. And Larry, you talked about it already once, you know, you, uh, this reluctance to talk to those younger folks about your experiences because you know you have these expectations of them and you still have you know kind of that it sounds like you still have this this idea this identity of a veteran that i'm going to assume you probably hold pretty near and dear because what you did was pretty important and or pretty important stuff overseas and thank you for that and when you come back to a community especially for the vietnam vets who came back to a community who i you're 24 hours from being out in the in the bush to being at an airport stateside, and people are spitting at you, calling you baby killer, that can be really hard and can actually make it really hard uh, to actually seek help when help is actually needed. So it's important to have culturally competent military communities. So um, let me check the time here, 11.30, a half hour left. So the military, what is the military? There are several uh, uniform services uh, of the United States mil uh, military. A lot of times we think of um, the big five, you know, the Army, the Navy, Air Force, the Marines, and the Coast Guard. Um, but there's also the Department of Health and Human Services has a commission corps, which wears Navy uniforms, gets paid Navy pay, and does things such as uh, dental clinics. They do research. Um, they get farmed out to the uh, CDC, but they are not combatant military. And so a lot of times when we think of military, we think of the combatant branches, which are these five here. Now, a little bit of a um, disclaimer on dates. I was reviewing these dates yesterday. And I came across some conflicting information. So don't quote me on these dates. Uh, these dates I got from the Department of Defense. Uh, however, I saw that there's some other uh, websites that are arguing different dates. So just bear with me here. <clears throat> Starting out with the biggest and the best, the United States Army, right? And we do the job, we do ground combat, we do awesome stuff. We were the first uh, group of the military to be established back in uh, 18, or sorry, 1784. What predates the Army is the National Guard. The National Guard was before there was even a constitution of the United States. That's that Minuteman who, uh, you look at the, the statue, and I have a plow in one hand and a rifle in the other hand. Because the Minuteman was the ones that actually fought for our independence. <clears throat> The population of the Army is just over a million, uh, roughly 50-50 split between the reserve component and the active duty. The U.S. Navy is the second largest, uh, established in 1794. Uh, they're about 100,000, a little more than 100,000 less than the Army. Air Force is roughly the same size, and they actually came out of the Army. They used to be the Army Air Corps in World War II. And so they were established in 1947 a little bit smaller than the Navy uh, and, and the Army. Then we have the few, the proud, the Marine Corps, uh, the Larrys in the group that uh, eat snakes and do all sorts of other things that uh, are not wholesome for this presentation. <laughs> no, the Marine Corps, the few and the proud, uh, established 1878. Now, if you look at the Marine Corps web, web page, they'll say that they're actually established with the um, Constitution. Uh, not according to the Department of Defense, so that's the disclaimer there. Active duty population about 200,000 less than the Army, uh, pretty small elite course. Uh, and then the Coast Guard, which the Coast Guard Reserve is actually smaller than the Michigan Army National Guard, I go figure. And their responsibility is the coastline, making sure that it is secure. Now, another disclaimer is the Coast Guard, since we have the establishment of Homeland Security, actually fall under Homeland Security and not the Department of Defense anymore unless they're called to go overseas to Afghanistan to do um, inspect luggage to ensure that our ports are, are all secure. 
So they're kind of a, a redhead stepchild. Why do not have on here? Anybody want to take a guess of what branch I'm missing? Space Force. Absolutely, the Space Force. They were established, what, two years ago now? And they actually fall underneath the United States Air Force, um, just like how the United States Marine Corps falls under the US Navy. Uh, I don't know what their population is. I, I think they're still getting information on that, but yeah, the Space Force is missing from here. Hi, this is Michelle Rodriguez. I'm in the Air Force. I think it's approximately 10,000. It's very small still. Wow, 10,000. So thanks. I remember hearing that number, but don't quote me on it. <laughs> That's okay. I hope they don't quote me on a lot of these uh, things too. So <laughs> thanks, Michelle. So 10,000, probably. Um, there is legislation for the Space Force to also be in the National Guard. Uh, that's currently under review. So we'll see how that goes. I know the two-star general for Michigan is pushing to have a Michigan Space Force. Uh, and they're actually putting landing pads up to um, along Lake Superior right now for space shuttle trips. So, hey, it gets close to home pretty quick. The main takeaway for the slide though is that approximately 45% of the United States military belongs to the reserve component. So usually when people think about the military service, they think of active duty. Very seldom do they think about the people who they interact with on a daily basis at work, the weekend warriors who drill one week in a month, two weeks in the summer, or in uh, Chaplain Brennan's case, uh, go deploy stateside for a year plus. <clears throat> and another important fact with this is that the level of culturation varies based off of branch, and which component you belong to. So if I'm active duty and I live on active duty post, the likelihood is I'm going to be much more acculturated to the military culture than if I'm, if I'm a weekend warrior serving in the Michigan National Guard and I only get exposed to it one week in a month, two weeks in the summer. So important to keep that in mind as well. Military organization structure. So I think it's important to note that in our democracy, the two top ranking individuals of the military are civilians. You have the president, who's the commander in chief, the secretary of defense. And that means that ensures that the military serves the people of the United States of the military, or sorry, the United States of, uh, of America. Within the active component, you have every single branch. And they get, that's 24-7. Uh, they live on active posts oftentimes. Um, but then with the reserve component, again, the 45%, and you have two Groups there, you have the reserves, which receive federal funding. They are regionally based, they're not confined to a state. They can be, um, when I was in the reserves, I drilled out of Livonia, Michigan, but my higher headquarters was out of Fort Snelling, Minnesota. Um, and then you have the National Guard, which is state specific. Uh, one caveat to this slide is I do, I have heard that the New York National Guard does have a Navy. Don't know why, but uh, I did hear that I want to confirm before you pass that. And I did add the Space Force to this one. And again, the, the asterisk next to Coast Guard means that they fall under the Department of Homeland Security unless deployed uh, overseas with the military. It's important to note that the military is a very highly organized hierarchy. And again, it's that, it's that pyramid with the president at the top. Um, and that with that hierarchy, it establishes rules, taboos, how you respond to each other, how you act, what your roles and responsibilities are. Um, like this wire diagram goes to uh, General Douglas MacArthur, and it was how his staff was structured underneath him. It's also important to note, I'm going to try to click this. We'll see if it works. Is that within current context, when we find ourselves in Iraq and Afghanistan, where we're fighting a war of ideas and ideology, that big things happen into small groups. So this is right off the, the Army's website. And it shows that, you know, really that fundamental, and you start with a soldier. That's your fundamental element. Take four soldiers, put them together, and you got yourself a team. After team, you have a squad, which is led by a staff sergeant, which is roughly 10 soldiers. Your platoon, which is led by a, a lieutenant of roughly 36 soldiers or two to three squads. And then your company, which is led by a captain, which can be uh, up to 200 soldiers. Now, the reason why I take the time to show you these four specifically 
is that with OIF, OND, OFS, um, and the current operations, is that big things happen in small units. It's no longer your division of tanks, Patton versus Rommel's tanks in World War II. It is me being out on patrol with my, with my squad and an ID blown up or us getting engaged by the enemy. And in that really small, tight-knit group, that type of trauma is much different than when it's two armies fighting head-to-head -head, uh, divisions of tanks with, with divisions of tanks. So why is it so important to understand? I talked about you know, big things happen in small groups. The military structure tells you who I can talk to. Like I have a brief coming up here, uh, June 4th. Um, actually the request for a brief came from a captain. It came to me as a major. I went to the chief of staff who was a Colonel. She passes on to the one-star general. He called me up, wanted me to brief him on it. He passed it up to the two-star general. So we scheduled that briefing for June 4th. And then I get a call from National Guard Bureau saying that there's going to be a rear admiral in the brief as well. And then the tag tells me that all the directors are going to be there as well, which are all stars. And then I get another news from uh, yesterday that there's going to be another two-star general in the brief. So I'll have this briefing. I had to go through all those levels to get up to the two-star general. Next thing I know, there's going to be eight stars in the room. No pressure. <clears throat> Trust me, I transcribed that entire brief. It also talks about, you know, back to your expectations and who lives where on an active duty post. That general at Two Star General's house, it's a really nice house in the middle of posts. And they have perfect lawn care. It's, it's just beautiful. But if you're an E4 and you're married, you're going to have kind of a, I don't know, kind of a little rough uh, apartment type living um, that may not be as well kept up. It also talks about how to define or how to deal with specific issues and problems. So if something happens, I go to my next, my first line leader, next person in the chain of command. If they can't handle it, it goes up to their first line leader, next person in the chain of command, and so on and so forth. And uh, theoretically, it can go all the way up to the president if need be. But that can create issues because it's such a structured uh, organization that if it's my first line leader who I have a problem with, and I may not actually seek help. Uh, it's, it's taboo to jump the chain of command to get help. And uh, this is particularly harmful when, it, when you look at um, military sexual trauma, for example. In a lot of those cases back in 2010-ish, uh, uh, the perpetrator of that crime was that first line leader. And so now you have a, a service member who the right way to get help is to go through that person who perpetuated the crime against them. And so they actually have to go around the chain of command through the uh, shark, uh, or SHARP office or through the chaplain's office to actually get help. It also talks about, um, it's important because it defines different privileges as well. If you come to Joint Forces headquarters here in Lansing uh, and you go to the headquarters building, you'll see specific parking spots that have a sign that says GO. That does not mean go, that means general officer. And I would strongly encourage you not to park there because you'll probably get towed away because they have the privilege of a nice parking space. Now looking at rank structure, again, simply put, the more stuff you have on your sleeves, the higher rank you are, the more people you have under your purview, the more responsibility you have. Um, <clears throat> one caveat to the rank structure is the warrant officers, which there's only warrant officers in the Army, Navy, and Marines. The Air Force does not have warrant officers, and they are, formerly and usually higher ranking enlisted members who become an officer by warrant to do a specific job. Most particular in the Army, we see them as pilots, um, which is kind of weird for the Army that we have all of our pilots are, are warrant officers, whereas the Air Force, it's usually the officers who are the pilots. So some different uh, cultural differences there. It's also important to know the difference between a captain and a captain. So when I was a captain, um, chaplain captain uh, several years ago, I went to the um, air, was it the Air Coast Guard base in Traverse City, and I buzzed into the gate to do my presentation, and somebody came on the intercom, says, how can I help you, sir, ma'am? I said, chaplain captain Lepley here, and then the, the, the comm just went silent. And you heard some shuffling around, and then you heard a much more mature voice come on the intercom, welcome aboard, sir, and they buzzed me in, and I got up to, to where I was parking, 
and there's a whole bunch of people out there waiting for me. I get out of the car with my butter bars, which are, or sorry, not butter bars, with my, uh, with my railroad tracks, which are here. I don't know if you can see my mouse or not. And they all looked at me, yeah, son of a gun, and said some uh, choice words because they were expecting a Navy or Coast Guard captain, which is a colonel. So they're expecting something much higher ranking than what I actually was. So important to keep that differentiation in mind as well. So be aware of subcultures as well. We have a four-star general here talking to some civilian at some party, it looks like cocktail hour, saying, and this one is for making certain military culture stays the same forever. Again, back to what I said at the beginning of this presentation, that military culture is very dynamic, that there's lots of subcultures, and that it has to, to keep pace with the larger US culture to be able to keep its reverence. Reverence, ah, that word is not, I'm not to today. Any questions on cultures before we get into families? Just, just one comment, because I don't think it's gonna come up, is that the VA hospital system is a very good research system, a good training system, it's very good to military people and veterans, and often uh, disrespected by even civilian medicine, but particularly vulnerable to saying outsourcing everything to civilian providers and say, well, it'll just be the same as the VA care. And yet, if you've been in the VA system for years and be treated according to the military culture and get dumped off to a civilian provider who doesn't think much of you and your, your history, uh, I, I think it's a disservice as much as possible. I think we should protect the veterans' uh, medical care through the VA system, or at least be sure what's provided in the civilian sector is comparable, so. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Bert. And the research I concluded a few years ago, what came up was, you know, a lot of people looked down on the WT as a whole, but what we really saw was that specific providers uh, whether it be a VA provider or a WTU provider is really what made or break the difference for that service member. If they had a good provider who cared, it was a good experience. If not, it was kind of a crummy experience. So thank you for sharing that. So we're going to jump into military families. <clears throat> um, I'm going to ask the question, I'm just hypothetically now, you know, what is a family? According to the dictionary, a family is a group of one or more parents and their children living together as a unit. I think this is a pretty shallow definition of a family. And after all, my doctorate is in uh, family diversity. So I, I know it's a really shallow definition. <clears throat> Within the research world, we, much, we think of families much more broadly. And we look at it through family systems theory a lot of times, which is an approach to understanding how human functioning focuses on interactions between the people and the family and between the context in which the family is embedded. Because families are not just isolated organizations, they belong to a part of a larger community. And so we look at systems. <clears throat> so here's uh, Broffenbrenner's, Yuri Broffenbrenner's socio-ecological theory. And it helps us understand that a person in the family belongs to that family, and that those family members belong to larger groups such as schools, they interact with teachers, they interact with service providers and peers, and all the way out to um, interactions with the larger system all the way up to the, the, the international level. And I thought this was really important to share because especially when I was looking at the WTU study that we completed, you have a service member who's taken out of their organic context and they're sent to a WTU, <clears throat> separated from their family, and they enter a different microsystem of people there. They're, they're comrades that are also going through treatment. And so they interact with them, but also they interact with their, their care providers. And <clears throat> shortly after, or shortly before we did the study, the US Congress had called a re, uh, for a review of the WTU, it's called the Returning Warrior Task Force. And so the United States Congress implementing changes to these uh, programs, uh, which impacted that one individual. And, by uh, extension, their families as well. And so <clears throat> it's really important to remember that service members are not just isolated, their families are not isolated, not just isolated, but they're impacted by their communities. This is case in point, when I was overseas, I sold a Jeep and 
And the guy came to pick up the Jeep and he should have known better. But my wife said that he that was in Afghanistan. He said, oh, he could die at any time. Because that culture, our community didn't understand what my wife was going through and the fear that she lived with every day um, with me being overseas. So a couple pictures here. A lot of times when we think of families, we think of nuclear families, which would be a picture off to the left. You know, we have a, looks like an army person hugging their child. It's also important to know that there's a thing called phenol families. And these are families which are more like my comrades. And it's also important, like I said earlier, big things happen in small groups, big things happen in that phenol family. And in some cases with a service member, that that phenol bond can outweigh that of their nuclear bond. And I've seen service members who have actually ended up getting divorced with their spouse because the spouse to understand the connection that that service member made with their brothers and sisters in arms while they were deployed. And because of that lack of understanding, the, the relationships ended up splitting. So families in the deployment cycle, I'm going to breeze through this pretty quick. Uh, Faber et al. Um, <clears throat> talks about uh, through the deployment cycle that the service member and their families will go through different emotions at different states. Uh, Pre-deployment, the service member will be physically present but psychologically absent. Deployment, physically absent, psychologically present. And redeployment or homecoming, physically present but psychologically absent. And this dichotomy really helps to shape the stress that the family goes through during the deployment cycle. Uh, this concept is based off of a concept of ambiguous loss, which was coined by Boss in 2000. And it really talks about how when people um, lose something but not really lose something. So it's oftentimes uh, used to describe having a parent with dementia. Your parent's still there, but they're not there. When a service member deploys, the service member might still be there in my heart, but they're not there. Or when they're getting ready to deploy, they could physically be there, but they're not there mentally. And so it's that the concept of ambiguous loss. Pre-deployment has lots of different emotions and they can oftentimes conflict. You can be detached, so your service member can be detached. Yet there can also be these feelings of pride, grief, conflict, but patriotism and excitement. And for a service member, a deployment can be something to really look forward to, <clears throat> but it can also be very difficult for the families. And so what we see pre-deployment, this is just a select few things I put on these slides. There's a lot more that you can uh, find about this, is that there's a rush typically to complete the to-do to list. It's that getting the family ready to deal with that service member being gone. We see the service member gets an amp up in training time, or they're away from their family more. They want to make sure things are taken care of at home. Uh, but also this um, strain of trying to meet the needs of the family versus the needs of the mission uh, of this battle of two greedy institutions, as I've heard it said before. The family, on the other hand, they really want to spend time with the service member. They may be concerned about the well being of the service member, they may not trust the command. They may not uh, believe in the mission, which can further exasperate the stress that they feel. And they'll also be trying to adapt to the concept of life without a service member. During the deployment member, going back to systems theory, picture a big jigsaw puzzle, if you will. And you take the service member, which is part of that jigsaw puzzle, and you pull it out. So the jigsaw puzzle represents all the stuff that the family does on a normal basis. And when you take that service member out, now there's this big hole in that family structure. And they got to figure out how to fill that hole. And so the service member, you know, they're, they're gone doing their job. They're focusing on the mission. They have oftentimes have this desire to, you know, be able to spend time or talk to family. And they really rely upon the ascribed battle buddies for emotional support. The family, on the other hand, they're just really trying to adapt that service member being gone. There's usually this one month of total chaos in a lot of family structures where they try to figure out who's going to mow the lawn, who's going to do the dishes, who's going to take out the trash, who's going to uh, take uh, Bobby or Sally to the soccer game. It can all be a big difficult thing for them to deal with. But the rule of thumb is, is that resilience develops for that family. And eventually that big hole that was created by that service member, the, the family adjusts and it gets filled in. They may be concerned, um, but they also have to rely upon their community for support. And back to what I said previously, if the community doesn't understand what that family is going through, the support that might be provided may not actually meet the mark. Uh, in the Meadows, it's really important to note that as goes the parent, so goes the child. 
That means that if the family, uh, if the pam, or if, sorry, if the parent that's home is functioning well, then the, the child is likely functioning well as well. If this, the parent is not functioning well, then there's going to probably be issues with the child. Then roughly one month before the service member comes home, <clears throat> the service member um, may start to become complacent. They might start thinking more about the homecoming and not so much about the mission, which can be deadly in some situations. And that can be really exciting though to be able to come home. But the key for uh, the, a successful homecoming is to make sure they start to communicate their expectations with their spouse. And the research that I'm currently doing, what we're seeing is that the difference between a healthy relationship and an unhealthy relationship is really how well that, that couple communicates. The family might have conflicting emotions. This, this thought of what do I have to give up? Well, my service member has been away. I've got to have this wonderful freedom and decent financial uh, backing to be able to do really whatever I want, whenever I want, and I have to consult my spouse. Uh, they could be excited, but they can also have this desire to really nest. Uh, one thing that my wife had shared was uh, just before I came home, I said, honey, when I left, the house was dirty. When I come home, I expect the house to be dirty too. And when I said that, it relieved a lot of pressure from her to not have to feel like the house had to be perfect for my return. And then we have reintegration, um, which is right where, you know, the service member is physically present but psychologically absent. So a lot of times the service member will be thinking about the deployment and be thinking about the next deployment. And in some cases, they may actually choose not to come home and stay overseas because honestly, when you're deployed, life is fairly easy. Um, I've also heard that service members may just come home and crash. They might want to just go to sleep for days on end. That's, that's normal in a lot of cases. But also it's moving from simplicity to complexity, um, which I shared with you with my example of the mayonnaise. The family also has to uh, adapt to that service member being home because that three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle was functioning well. Now the service member is coming home and how are we going to bring them back into the fold of the family routines, which is role negotiation and sometimes conflict. Some special concerns, and we are almost done. Say, I know it watches right around the corner. Is, you know, be aware of substance abuse, um, especially alcoholism for service members. Uh, on average, uh, 2020 an article came out that said between 30 to 40% of service members, depending on branch, have uh, risky alcohol consumption behaviors, um, and that can be amplified post-deployment. They may take risks that are undue, such as speeding. They may be withdrawn, and also keep, a mind, keep an eye on mental health functioning as they try to adapt to, who am I now that I'm home? Family, uh, conflict management, especially communication, substance abuse for the spouse, and children as well. Uh, also keep an eye on mental health functioning and financial management. It's not uncommon for service members in the reserve component to come home with a lot of money in their bank and six months later be having to get food stamps because they just didn't manage their, their finance as well. Simply put, uh, back to systems theory is that one element affects all other elements of the system. And all elements will have to adjust to the change in that one element. What we covered? Are we covered? Military culture, military relationships, and families. With that, are there any questions? Just a comment. Uh, when I lived in Albuquerque up until the last couple of years, we were involved in mental health out there. And we had a fair amount of problems with deployments of first responders from our community and coming back and forth and the stress. And so all the things you point out were compounded by the responsibilities and stress uh, when they were emergency techs or police or fire or whatever in Albuquerque and we had suicides and drunk driving and all kinds of issues uh, and and flipping back and forth with multiple deployments uh, as you must certainly know uh, just adds to anything you have to, in this recipe here. Absolutely it's not an isolated thing. Too true. Hello. Any other questions before we uh, put yes, this in this? Yeah Michelle. Mich um, so I'm over here in Germany and uh, program director for the Air Force's Deployment Transition Center. And I've also worked with um, the Army up at Baumholder, who has been taking care of some of the soldiers that are deployed up to Poland. And just recognizing that as war changes and you don't hear as much about what's happening over in Southeast Asia, that doesn't mean that people aren't still coming back very stressed for a multitude of reasons. And as we move more into the European theater with some of the, the threats um, in that direction, that 
again, just because there isn't necessarily combat doesn't mean that reintegrating after nine months away from your family isn't very difficult. So I think that it's important because I think that there's a perspective in American society that doesn't match the reality of what these individuals are coming back and dealing with. So I just wanted to point that out for the providers over there. Very well put, Michelle and uh, Dodkison. <laughs> Any other <Bit> questions? To <laughs> we have uh, one minute left. Anything else? Hearing nothing. Uh, my contact information is here. Feel free to reach out to me if you have questions or uh, comments. Um, I'm going to hand the, the floor on over to the folks over to the Hidden Wounds of War conference. Thank you, Chaplain Lepley. Uh, appreciate the, uh, uh, your presentation and your comments. Um, just a reminder to everybody that uh, Jacob has placed the uh, survey in the, in the chat. And uh, if you're attending for uh, CEUs, that is, uh, that is mandatory. Um, and we'd love to hear everybody's feedback. Uh, we'll break for lunch, and then the general session will begin again at uh, 1 p.m. With, uh, with Dr. Brock, and the link to that can be found in the confirmation email that you received. Again, thank you, uh, Chaplain Lepley. Yeah, thank you all. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>